Thank you. Welcome everybody to tonight's program. Um, we have with us today, Lindsay Taylor, and Lindsay is a garden designer and floral stylist based in upstate New York. Her company, Lindsay Taylor Designs, creates gardens and landscapes for public and private clients throughout the Northeast. Prior to founding her design studio, Lindsay was for more than a decade, a floral expert, writer, and editor for several publications, including Martha Stewart Living, Domino, Garden Design Magazine. Her work has appeared in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. For nearly a decade, she produced, wrote, and styled the journal's well-loved flower school column. Her book, Art and Flower, Finding Inspiration in Art and Nature, Lindsay, Hi. <laughs> Hold it up. Hold it up. Lindsay. Well, well, the book. Sorry, I just used it to prop up my computer. <laughs> That's okay. Um, okay. Introduces readers to a unique practice that combines art and flowers, ultimately offering a new way to look at the natural world. Um, we will have time for questions at the end. Um, so please, while Lindsay is speaking, put your questions in the chat function. Um, also, I want to mention that if you're interested in purchasing the book, there's a link. We have a link in the chat function. Do we not, Joan? I think. There should be a link. And um, the, um, the publisher is offering 20% off. And it's with the code FIDEN20. It's P-H-A-I-D-O-N-20. And you get 20% off. Um, please check the Chapel Garden Club's website for our upcoming programs that, that are happening. We have plant sales coming up. We have lots of programs and we'd love to see you all. So without further ado, we welcome Lindsay and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, thank you to the Chappaqua Library and the Chappaqua Garden Club for having me tonight and all of you who are out there uh, tuning in. Um, I'm excited to share, share this talk with you. Um, the talk really will take you through kind of my story a little bit, um, my process focusing on the column that I had for nine years uh, in the Wall Street Journal off-duty section, a weekend, uh, a weekend section of the um, of the newspaper once a month uh, for nine years, I had a column called Flower School. And that is essentially what the book is based on. So just starting here with a little video of um, one of the arrangements that actually did appear in the column and um, you know, and you'll see throughout this talk, uh, I'm, I've am i now been a garden designer for about um, maybe 18 years now, I guess, and I really still love uh, creating floral arrangements. I'm not a, a florist uh, per se as a, a business, I'm a garden designer, but um, you'll see that my arrangements are um, very personal, um, sort of intimate gestural arrangements, and I will take you through um, this process. So that arrangement was inspired by the Joan Moreau here that you see um, a wonderful painting, um, very playful and my process with these arrangements, uh, you'll see really trying to pick up the shapes, the colors, the mood, the the sort of, you know, in this case, the, the uh, kinetic kind of dancey, airy quality of uh, this particular work of art. And here I am just stepping back a little bit. There I am in my studio in Newburgh, New York. We um, moved our operations out of the city about 10 years ago. We have a big, my husband has a big building in Newburgh where he has his business and I am fortunate to have a lovely studio there. So that's where I do a lot of my design, design work. And um, there I am in one of the gardens that I've been designing and working on uh, for about eight years now um, in the Hudson Highlands. And as Jennifer mentioned, I started off my career. I'm actually Canadian. I moved to New York in, in 95, 96. And I was fortunate to land a job with Martha Stewart Living Magazine in the early days. There was only about 60 employees. And some of you might be familiar with the name Margaret Roach, who has a wonderful column in the New York Times and also a great blog called Away to Garden. And she hired me as her first uh, garden uh, assistant for the newly formed garden department at the, at the magazine. So that was a really fun place to be, a really great time to be involved in, in that company. And I was there for about, um, about a decade. 
and doing garden content, doing garden content um, for the magazine and the TV show. But um, quickly, uh, they realized that I enjoyed doing flower arranging. So I, I pretty early on became the go one of the go-to floral arrangers for the cover, for all the different uh, stories that we would do. And it was um, you know, a great opportunity to play. And from there, I moved to on to Domino Magazine as their garden editor for a few years. And uh, Garden Design Magazine, and then uh, slowly went freelance, um, writing freelance stories for T Magazine, and also doing floral styling for beauty companies um, and so forth. So here's just a, the opening picture for my uh, my website for my garden design um, company. And uh, this is a picture from one of the gardens. Uh, this picture is is very, very me, um, both in the way I design um, herbaceous borders, but also in the way I do arrangements. Um, you see the the vertical, um, the vertical elements, the different uh, textures of leaves, the soft, the the hard, harder edges. Um, and you'll see that throughout this talk, how my gardens really relate to my style, the style of my gardens really relate to the way I arrange. Oops. Uh, and there's just my process. I uh, do most of my designing um, by hand and then um, involve other people to do the CAD work. Um, and I love that process. I think it's really important, even if you're comfortable with the computer, to get pen to paper uh, when you're designing even a garden just for yourself. I think a lot of a lot more ideas come through um, that hand, that that process. And here's one of the first gardens I designed in Brooklyn Heights, a uh, townhouse garden uh, for a creative couple uh, who gave me the only brief of please nothing common. Uh, so they really loved interesting plants. Not that there's, um, I mean, foxglove you see here and hellebores and allium, not terribly esoteric, but um, deep in that garden are a lot of special plants that fortunately I'm still friends with them and get to visit. Uh, they're artists and she's a potter and a photographer. So it's it's packed with wonderful plants. And it really, um, it was really an extension of my own garden that I had in the city, which was really a laboratory of all my favorites. And just a couple more pictures of tiny pocket gardens, um, shady gardens, um, the challenges of city gardening and how to bring light and interest to smaller spaces. I love working with stone, uh, uh, creating patterns. A lot of these gardens, particularly in Brooklyn, are looked at from the windows rather than actually being in them. So that view is very important. Um, and the text, this tiny middle picture is a tiny little garden that's off the kitchen in a uh, West Village garden, very dark, was very sad before we got in there um, and just offering light and interest. And rooftop gardens, I did quite a few of those for a while. Um, I love the the contrast of the geometry of, of hardscape with the wild and wooliness of using plants. This is sort of um, a little bit of a signature. Um, and this this sort of contained garden um, is like a little, little chunk of meadow on the rooftop. And um, and tight palettes of green and white. That was the client's directive for the wisteria. You see, uh, over that trellis, there was nothing here when um, when I inherited this project. And those wisteria are still going well, thanks to a great gardener who root prunes those, um, which you need to do after some time of growing those small. They're actually large pots, but small once the wisteria gets going. And then this is just a, a favorite um, shot from my last garden that I had in the city. This is um, another, my gardens were really laboratories of growing plants. And this was a Graham Thomas, a David Austin rose that I found in a dumpster. And a friend is still growing this rose. It's a wonderful rose. Um, roses are, are beautiful things and also incredibly tough. Um, and here's the garden um, I've been working on for quite some time up in the Hudson Highlands. And again, you see that that contained structure that I like. This is, these are 14. This is one small section of a very large project. Um, these are 14 foot beds that I work very hard with with the gardeners on this property. And we're constantly editing and and sort of um, working these beds like you would in an arrangement. 
Um, they're just, these are sort of our madcap beds that overlook a larger vegetable garden. And they're great uh, all year round from bulbs to late season seed heads. This is a view of it. Um, you know, I do love sort of, you know, just balancing on the edge of a garden going too far um, and looking like, you know, it's been a little bit left, but still has wonderful patterns and textures. Um, it's it's easy for a garden like this to go too far with seeds blowing around. But um, fortunately, I have some great gardeners helping me on this one. And just a few more pictures um, showing you color palettes I like and plants I like to work with. I, uh, if I was to say the most important things to bring to a garden, I would say definitely fragrance. I'm always thinking about introducing plants that are fragrant. Uh, I like um, verticals uh, and umbels, but I also think it's really important to have movement and sound. Uh, movement with plants that blow in the wind and sound with plants that uh, bring uh, birds and insects, but also water features are really helpful for that. And that really creates a dynamic, interesting garden. And just showing some uh, wonderful moments in this garden where I, I love when plants, and it's true, and you'll see in my arrangements uh, that cascade over something. This is an incredible clematis called summer snow that's just, um, you know, just that's just one plant and um, a great bloomer, but I like to have a cascader in my arrangements and then these vertical perennial digitalis in a shade portion. So finding inspiration, I mean, the part of the big part of the column was by, uh, a way for people to find inspiration for their flower arrangements. But I also like to think about finding in inspiration for my own gardens and, and, uh, I find that in many different places, not just going to visit other gardens, in nature, in shapes, in art. Um, and this is just a page from my journal section in my website, uh, taking photographs and traveling and being out in nature is a very big part of my practice. And this is a, a shot I took in the Cape, uh, just showing, I was just amazed by the natural patterns that happened here that would be so wonderful just to copy. I mean, this is basically looks like a, a created garden or landscape, but it's natural how the natural meandering path was created over time. The ground cover of the bayberry or the bearberry, I should say, punctuated by the pitch pines. Um, just, you know, wonderful moment. Um, and finding these moments when you're out walking is a great uh, way to sort of collect ideas for your own garden. Uh, winter, I love all seasons. Uh, winter is an important uh, time of year for me to study landscapes when it's more monochromatic and you just have the graphic shapes of seed heads, very sculptural. And thinking about your environment where you uh, actually live. And in my case, it's very rocky and the mountain laurels, the native mountain laurels play a big part. So um, being very present about, um, you know, and, and aware of what the environment that you're in and thinking about that um, and bringing that into your work. Visiting gardens, this is a fun shot uh, of Sissinghurst. Some of you might be familiar with it, but I like, to, I like to have this picture in my chalk just to remind people to not always follow the regular path, to look at gardens, look, get behind the scenes, to see what's going on. I mean, I, I love this madcap moment and Sissinghurst behind the walls off the beaten track. Um, or getting to visit um, great gardens uh, at different times of day, not just in the middle of the day. I was fortunate to be able to stay at Grave Tie in England and be there, look at look at the garden early in the morning or late at night, and Great Dixter, where I took a, a, a couple week course there. So I was in the garden more than just that one quick moment as a visitor, and getting those opportunities uh, really does help and improve your gardening. Inspiration for my arrangement, I always have to turn to Constance Spry, who uh, started arranging in her 50s. Uh, she was really breaking the rules and um, was a real force for the time, believing that roadside weeds uh, were just as beautiful as spending a lot of money on fancy imported flowers. And she uh, is a real inspiration for a lot of my, my peers and you know, using who like to use seed heads and, and leaves and even her wonderful famous arrangement of just kale. Uh, 
She also shows, she was also very interested in her, in vessels and created some amazing vessels um, that she designed, ceramic vessels that are still around today, if you're lucky to find them. And um, vessels you'll see are a very big part of my arranging. So there's the cover of my book, Art and Flower. And the column, if you're not familiar with how that looked in the Wall Street Journal. So every month I chose a work of art and made an arrangement. And I was always thinking about what season we were in, what month, and specifically what month, what's happening in nature, what's happening in the garden. Um, you know, what is a work of art that relates to the feeling of that month? Uh, so always thinking, um, being able to write, not just about uh, how to make the arrangement, but um, getting people outside. So the book is organized by season, um, by seasons, starting with spring and spring. Um, when I think of spring, I think I think of the the incredible yellows that come to us early in spring, the lime greens. Um, to me, seasons really have a color palette. And I really played that up with uh, each arrangement I did. So this is an early one I did. Um, really, these are not meant these arrangements are really not meant to be copies so much of the of the work of art i'm not studying every little detail but they do you know having to use a work of art to create something you do spend more time you look more carefully you slow down you see things that you might not see rushing around in a museum or you know it gives you an opportunity to really study a work of art um, and this one, I really wanted the arrangement to not only pick up the colors and the sort of the impressionist aspect with dotting and single flowers and bud vases, but also the casualness and the mood of picking flowers as you were walking down that path. I love using clusters of vessels because you can separate them out to put throughout the house. You can use them as one as a grouping, as one single thing in the middle of a table or even separate them out down uh, the center of a table. And it's a great way to see what's happening in the garden or outside and just bring a little bit of that inside to your life. So I was always pushing myself with this column, trying to get me myself to do different kinds of arrangements to see a work of art like this Anne Truitt and how would you make an arrangement from that that felt like they belong together. So choosing a very modern, clean vessel, uh, and then creating this strong saturated yellow uh, palette with the mimosas and the daffodils and then slashing it with the white daffodils coming through the middle like the slash of her work. And the big rule I had for my column was that I didn't, I would, I was doing a work of art that had nothing to do with flowers so that you were pushed into sort of a place of, I was pushed into a place of um, a little bit uncomfortable. I would choose the vessels usually ahead of time. I would um, choose the work ahead of time, but it wasn't usually till the morning of that I would choose the flowers, which sometimes nearly put me into a bit of a pickle uh, when I arrived at the flower market, wondering what I was gonna do with this painting that I'd chosen. Um, but fortunately I found uh, the lady slipper orchid that you see just at the at the rim of the glass vessel to sort of mimic the hummingbird around her neck, the fritillaria coming up at the top uh, to sort of the same color as the headpiece she's wearing, but also the same kind of pattern almost and drumstick alliums dancing around the arrangement like the insects and then of course rich tropical foliage. And this one would have, I think this one ran in, um, April, April showers, uh, and I wanted it to feel almost like a nod to Ikebana um, and the Gerber daisies at the top relating to the parasol and the little mascari picking up the back of her, the blue in the back of her kimono. And these uh, stem vessels I love using, um, this one's made by Marate Acosta. All the vessels are in the back of the book, uh, the artist's names, uh, but it's wonderful. It's easy to play with and cutting stems to different length creates a much more interest in an arrangement. And even if you buy a uh, just a bundle from the grocery store, I always suggest that you cut them for at the stems to different lengths. 
And this was a fun challenge. This was my dad's idea, actually. He sent this to me. There was a retrospective of her her work going on at the Whitney. And um, I thought, okay, well, that's going to be a challenge. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. But I thought, why not? That's what this column was about. It was really about pushing my eye and pushing my my ability. So I really had fun with this one. I was lucky to find this vessel that really picked up the graphic dark shapes in her work and the um, these drums, drumstick alliums that are actually grown in Japan. The Japanese are doing wonderful things with uh, growing flowers and they grow these between plates of glass so that these these um, bends in the stem are actually, you know, they're solid. They're not going anywhere. I was lucky to find those at the flower market. Um, and I'm always mixing in things from the flower market and my I always would look in my own garden before um, that was always my first step. And you'll see throughout the, um, I think throughout the arrangements, how I'm always creating the flowers and vessels to be one. So I'm always cutting a few flowers to be short and to break the rim of the vessel so that there's no choking of the flowers. Um, I'm always, you know, trying to create this singular look. And I think you'll see that throughout summer. Summer, we get into pastels and more romantic colors, the pinks and so forth. And, and then in the heat of the summer, the meadow flowers, the richness, the hot, the hot colors, um, this Steven corn, I wanted something very, very vibrant and very, very meadow-like. So this would have ran in July. Um, picking up the sort of layers and layers of paint in his painting and trying to create those layers in the arrangement. And this Salomon Tour uh, painting, a young artist who had also had a retrospective at the Whitney, uh, really wanted that movement of the dancers, the pink, the pink of his pants seems so important and to pick that up with the ranunculus and, and the movement of the, of the uh, willow foliage, just, you know, creating the arms and the limbs. It just seems very limmy, that painting and the beautiful rich greens, the blue, cut some blue del delphinium really short to pick up the blues in the painting and then use this cluster of vessels that really, I felt picked up the darker tones, the wood of the furniture and the blacks in some of the clothing. And this Hockney was is really one that um, probably is, is, you know, it has an arrangement in the painting and I created a similar arrangement in, in, the, um, in my, my still life, but uh, mostly I'm not doing that, um, but that seemed like a fun thing to do. But one of the things I like to point out with this painting is how important that yellow book is on the table, I think. And without that yellow in the painting, your eye kind of gets lost, but the yellow helps keep you moving. So I brought that in with the yellow tulips and the sash on her dress. You know, I'm always looking for what's what's grabbing me in this painting, what's holding my interest. Um, the, the beauty berries became the sash and then the whites of the telephone and the cat and the lilies all kind of keeping your eye moving. And I think even when you're just making an arrangement at home, it's important to think of those things. Just an intimate little um, Indian painting and wanted something very rich and exotic with bringing in the kangaroo paws and the, the rich yellow roses and the seed heads of eucalyptus and, uh, and then that, that cascading clematis just picking up the little bit of bluey purple in her uh, sari. And then fall, such a great time for jewel tones and seed heads and all the autumnal russet colors of uh, foliage and uh, Rich, Richard Sarah, who just passed the other day, yesterday, yesterday I think. Um, uh, this was a really fun challenge, a uh, wonderful installation at Dia Beacon. It's always there. It's a great room to visit. It has this wonderful Vermeer-like light that comes through the windows. These huge Corten steel um, sculptures are constantly changing in color, and there's so much color and texture in them. And I really wanted to sort of pick that up with a, a sort of a handsome little arrangement that had sort of that mightiness of his of his work uh, with the, the seed heads, um, the berries of viburnum, and then the foliage of um, physocarpus, uh, fall foliage, just picking up all those tones. 
and just two wonderful little vintage vessels that uh, that kind of look like they're made from metal. And Magdaliani, just you know, thinking about hit the shapes that he's so famous for, and that that low, low slouchy shoulder, and and this vessel that I had, which is one of the earliest ceramic pieces I bought from a potter um, based actually now where I live in Garrison. Um, you know, it it on its own was almost said enough about the painting, so I wanted to be very careful with how much I put in the arrangement, but the the willow picking up all the sort of impressionistic painting style of the background and the um, the sort of warm tones of her skin being picked up by the single hydrangea flower and uh, the two little buttery yellow zinnias in the foreground. And then that cascading uh, Queen Anne's lace or Ami Magus just sort of drifting over the edge, just sort of really establishes that sort of moody kind of longing sort of feeling of the painting. And this was really fun. This was a real challenge. It's the main uh, and New York artist um, in her 90s now. And I love this painting that I saw at the Farnsworth Museum in Maine and um, and had decided on it for a uh, late, you know, I think it was a September uh, month. And, uh, but as I was heading into the city to do the shoot, I thought, oh my gosh, what, how am I going to find those colors in flowers? And I remembered a friend of mine um, on the way in uh, had rose amazing dahlias. And I was thinking, my gosh, she might have them. So at 6.30 in the morning, I texted her and ran in and uh, snipped some of her perfectly matching dahlia color to uh, the wall of this painting. Um, and then that Gerber daisy at the top, picking up the singular bare light bulb at the top of that painting, which creates a lot of intrigue. And again, you see me cascading with the, the drooping yellow um, uh, marigold and then breaking the line of my vessel. So it becomes, um, they become all one object. And I really wanted to do a, a textile artist. This is Sheila Hicks um, in the in November uh, when things are getting cozy and indoors and you're thinking about um, <clears throat> about weaving or knitting and uh, and being warm. And so I picked this um, Sheila Hicks piece and really wanted the arrangement to feel tight. A lot of my arrangements are airier, but this was 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 appropriate for a textile piece and really weave almost like the flowers are woven together and the chrysant the rich chrysanthemum in the foreground and everything feels you know almost like you could walk on that arrangement. I was lucky to find cotton uh, stems of cotton in the flower market that morning and porcelain berries that picked up the turquoise uh, in her work, and I had to do the Mona Lisa and it was really this is an interesting. Um, exercise actually, because I thought I knew this painting until I really started to look at it and realized that there was a lot of blue in the painting. I hadn't even thought about the Mona Lisa having blue, but how important that water and blue is in the back um, behind her and how muddy the painting would have really been without that. Um, so I played that up with the delphinium and used the uh, a still be, this the sort of pokey a still be, almost like her fingers and the late season um, nine bark or physocarpus when it's going to the uh, wonderful seed heads and just layering in um, those tones that are in the painting. And winter, of course, great. Uh, it's a monochromatic time, but it's also a time when, uh, when the berries stand out and wonderful sculptural shapes stand out. And if you're lucky, sometimes flowers poking through, these are my hellebores poking through in February. But uh, this Pollock, just a very monochromatic, fun way to use seed heads. Again, the cluster of vessels. Just, you know, these could be just regular objects you have at home. And then the moodiness of this really dreamy uh, Whistler uh, that uh, is at the Frick um, and just wanted something that felt very dreamy, very romantic and not with a lot of color. So again, picking up that mood of winter that's very monochromatic. And in January, I would always do something playful, so a sort of palette cleanser. So this Kandinsky would have ran in January, just, you know, sort of fireworks of color. And the stem vessels are really good for a quick gestural arrangement. 
And I love doing monochromatic uh, arrangements. I think it's a great way to start if you're not comfortable making arrangements is to buy, uh, you know, five different flowers that are all in the same color, basically, but they won't be exactly the same color. So it creates uh, movement in your arrangement right away. Um, so in this case, I have rose, red roses, I have tulips, I have ilex berries, and I think there's even a, a an amaryllis cut short in there and all creating some undulation with the lengths I'm cutting so that there's interest, there's shadows, just like in this Scarpita piece of the layering of the fabric, there's create shadows and tones. And this phalatone one in the winter, just showing uh, what a winter arrangement can look. This could be a holiday arrangement uh, using the uh, roses and carnations, the little pink carnation picking up the little girl's dress and the little bit of larkspur picking up the blue in the painting and then using the reds and that um, evergreen and the little pine cones is the woodiness and richness of, of um, the wood and her big sort of sagey color sash picking that up with the greens in the, in the evergreen. And this is my, um, this is in my studio, the other side of my studio, where I have kind of a large collection of a rain of vessels over the years, I've managed to collect quite a few, but vessels are very important to me. And I think they're very important to arrangements. You, they don't have to be fancy, but they have to be considered when you're making an arrangement. And if I had only two vessels, it would be a pitcher and bud vase. Um, bud vase I use all the time just you know I my morning meditation is popping outside and seeing what's blooming in any or seeing what's of interest even in the winter and snipping a little snip um, and putting it in a bud vase and I think a pitcher shape is a very easy way for a beginner to make a simple arrangement and it sort of holds the arrangement but lets it open up um, and just thinking about vessels and, and shapes that kind of work, it's nice to have something sort of modern, glass, I'm playing a lot more with glass these days, something vintage, uh, something handmade, wide bowls are wonderful. When I'm working with a wide bowl, like the black one on the bottom, I would use uh, chicken wire, which I reuse all the time. And these stem vases that ceramic artists are making, and of course, um, bud vases. And tools are important, uh, sharp snips. I usually have a pair of um, pair in my car in case I see something, loppers for reaching a little bit further, chicken wire. And I love flower frogs. I don't use them as much um, anymore as I used to. I tend to just work with the shape of the vessel. Uh, it's really important that we, you know, move away from using things like flower foam and, and anything that's not biodegradable. Uh, so I think that's really important to, uh, you know, consider your vessel so that you don't need the mechanics that we used to use in the past with the oasis and things like that. Um, just a few tips uh, that I always am considering um, when I'm making ar arrangements. Uh, clean vase, very important. Clean water, trim on an angle, remove the foliage that's underwater, never have the foliage um, submerged. Refresh the water as often as you can, keeping it away from heat source and direct sun. And most importantly, let your arrangement age. Don't be don't be tossing it too soon. Um, there's beauty in the aging process of flowers, and it's fun to watch. And as flowers die in your arrangement, you can take those out and let the arrangement become something else. So just a reminder about um, floral foam, which I mentioned, and then other techniques that you can use. Uh, chicken wire is really such a great one. I uh, floral, floral, it's floral chicken wire. So it's not just straight chicken wire. It's a little easier to manipulate and scrunching it up and putting it inside a bigger vessel that's not able to hold um, uh, to hold your flowers as well is a great, uh, great thing to have on hand. And just a few tips, a few more tips about um, arranging. You know, I, I I know all the rules from years of doing this. Uh, I tend to toss them over my shoulder when I'm making arrangements, but I know they're probably still in there. And the bit, most important thing is to keep uh, an interest in, and, and, and movement in your arrangement, just like a garden. And here's another little, little video from one of the um, artworks I did. 
for the Wall Street Journal, uh, that trick of the tape, the cross hatching of tape over a vessel is great too, for a quick solution for supporting flowers. And here's a grander arrangement using the evergreen foliage to sort of support the orchids and then ending it with this dramatic white uh, protea to pick up the richness of the fur and the plumes in her hat. And that's my talk. Hope you enjoyed it. I can't um, Lindsay, it was great. Can you do me a fit to tell us what your process is? Do you first choose your painting and then you then go out and do your book for a vessel first and then the flowers or how does that how, what's your process yeah so i i would think about what season i was in what month i was in and then i'd start uh looking either hopefully i could see the work of art in person but also i wanted to draw on on shows that were happening elsewhere in the world um so i would look online and see what exhibits were happening um and just start to to wean it down um and thinking about you know color and mood and and challenging myself so not always having it be a painting you know sculpture or um or the textile i did and then we would uh, I would, you know, I'd work with my editors and they would mostly say yes and sometimes get pushed back and <laughs> and we go back to the drawing room and find some more. But I would shoot three uh, three months uh, at, at a shoot. So we would do three at once. So I had to cheat. I, I you know, I try to use as much from my garden and locally as possible, but I'd have to go to the flower market and cheat a little bit with the seasons. That's what I was going to ask. I can't imagine you get all these amazing flowers from your garden at, at any moment. Oh, I mean, I definitely augmented and had fun going to the flower market and I'm lucky to have the New York flower market, but, um, but you'd be surprised how much, you know, I, I would find, you know, I do, I do grow a lot of different plants, um, but uh, yeah, there's always something out there. I'll say. Um, Somebody asked if you could hold up the back of the book so they could see the Frank Stella. Well, oh, that is, is right, right there. there. Yeah. It's right so, there. Yeah. Okay. Right there. So, so there we go. That was a question. It. It's right there. Um, so how, so is it, is it, what's the most difficult part? Choosing the painting, choosing the vessel or, or constructing what you want it to look like? Um, well, uh, it's all, it's all a fun process. And I think it's, you know, the, the reason actually I came up with this column, um, yeah, that, that was my next question. Oh, okay. Well, people would ask me, how do you figure out what to arrange? I don't know what to buy or whatever. And, and I thought, well, what about looking at a work of art? And I know, and I didn't know at the time, but I know now, of course, there's art and bloom at, at museums. It's been a tradition since the seventies, but, um, at the time, I didn't know. I thought it was just a great way to push yourself to use colors you might not put together. Um, you know, I would never necessarily think to put those colors together that Frank Sella offered for for right. me. Um, so it pushes you to like and take you know take a take a your phone or a photocopy of um, a color Xerox of a painting with you to the shop and sort of you know, go, okay, I need some peach. I need some, you know, and you don't even have to make your arrangement look like the work of art, but it gets you to work with colors you might not have otherwise. Um, so now I forgot your question, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, what was the most challenging? That's okay. You oh, the most challenging. So yeah, I mean, probably, you know, it, uh, you know, it, it was, all of it was fun, you know, finding yeah. the vessel that made sense with the arrangement too. Like I was always thinking about what the mood is of the work of art and what made sense and what color and should it be glass or should it be vintage or should it be, um, you know, what shape should it be? Uh, so that was fun. And then, yeah. And then, and then the flowers can be, you know, as challenging as you want it to be, I guess. Um, do you find it challenging? The deer, you have plenty of deer up where you are, but maybe you're uh, all fenced in. I don't know, but I'm not fenced in. I'm not really into that. Um, I choose wisely. Um, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I was lucky. Um, 
I didn't, I haven't had gardens where they've been um, big and the, and the landscape that I have now, I mean, I garden a lot for other people. The landscape I have is very native, very in keeping with we're, we're living on um, sort of a rocky dry terrain where I am now um, in the Garrison Highlands. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of planting what was already there. So they're not that interested. They like the, yeah, the fancy new stuff. Right. <laughs> the exotic things. <laughs> this is very inspirational because, you know, I don't usually typically say, okay, I'm going to look at a painting and I'm going to create a, my arrangement based on the painting, but it sort of does get you thinking, right? I, feel I, I think we should collectively pool our money and buy lots of art and uh, put it around, <laughs> you know, maybe the club, give everybody inspiration, but it, it's, it's beautiful. It's, the book is beautiful. It, it, it's it's exquisite and right now i'm thinking to myself okay what kind of vessels right. do i have right you know, just when i looked at that pic that image you had of all the shelves filled you know color coordinated you know <laughs> the material that it was made from it was fascinating and i'm ready to go i never thought of some of those little bottles how pretty they all look together clustering um, yeah clustering is a great trick clustering is great lot. Um, and, um, and, and I'm sure you have a lot of things in your house that, that yeah. maybe, uh, you know, a teacup or a mixing bowl or something that, that actually could turn into a great, um, vessel for an arrangement. So, um, yeah. You know, I, I kept thinking of my children when they were in elementary school, they would make these vases right. you know, comb, and those would probably be perfect right now. Um, yeah, it was lovely. It's just. Yeah, really beautiful. So much food for thought, so to speak. Um, yeah. And copying Opens your mind, getting inspired by the paintings was. The Frida Kahlo was, I mean, that one, I mean, they're all amazing, but some <laughs> I wrote down the Frida Kahlo one, the Medigliani one, um, the Zero Lewis Jim. Todd was unbelievable, like really quite inspirational. Well, you can see that I was really trying to push myself, you know, not using the same kind of artwork and not using right, yeah. the same period and and just really, you know, that that pacing for the nine years that and this is just 40 in the book, there's 40 of what I did over nine years once a month. So there's a lot more that I did than than what's in the book. But um yeah, it was it was kind of incredible how it really, you know, someone like myself who's quite visual and comfortable looking at art, how much it opened my mind and got me to see things that I um, that I hadn't noticed before. And so that's what I really encourage people to, you know, when you're forced, when you're asking yourself to create something from something, you look a little harder and you see things that you um, might not have seen before. And that's you know, this this book is really about trying to get people to look and to see um, and to slow down a bit and see what's around them. And the way the designers did the book, it's really uh, fun because they could have done the done it side by side like you're seeing on the screen right now. But it's first the artwork, then you have to turn the page for the arrangement. So it makes you think about what you would do before you see what I do. And you can go back and forth. So it also really slows people down when they're looking at the book. You know, they're not right. You can't really race through the book and get the idea. No, and you um, have to remember what you saw in the art when you turn right. the page. Yeah, Otherwise or, or don't, turn, don't turn the page, right. and make right. your own arrangement and then see what I did. So it's kind right. of a game. <laughs> or else you really can get your father to send you a painting. <laughs> and then you have to duplicate it. I loved it. I actually I adored the the images that you had after that. The flower Lindsay, arrangement. Was Lindsay, wonderful. um so they uh, I don't have can you give us the ordering info for the book? So we yeah. don't have it in the chat. Do um, you have it? If you could type it in, Lindsay, that would be helpful. I don't have function. no, I'm sorry, I don't have it. I thought Laura um from okay, my hold on, hold on, hold on. Um maybe. But this for all of us watching, I mean I never done anything like this but the idea of doing it is is intriguing it's wonderful and don't, and don't, okay yes you so, so you, you go to you go to p-h-a-i-d-o-n wait wait i'll put it in the chat it's it's p-h that's the Biden. 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 Hold on. Biden. P -H biden a i d o n a i d o n i'm sorry i got to p-h a i d o n 
And then you go to the book, Art and Flower. You find the book, Art and Flower. Oh. And then you type in um, Faden, P H A I D O N 20. And then, and then you get in. your 20% discount. I'm sorry. What do you type in then? The same thing. Faden, P H A I D O N uh -huh. 20. And then you get your 20% discount. Got it. That's the code. Fiden 20 is the yeah, code. Yeah, Fiden. And it's P H A I D O N. Okay. Okay, so that I should will. help everybody. I just sent it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Great. And this this will be up, this is, we're recording this, right, Joan? This will be on Yeah, the so this website. is recorded and um, everyone could re -watch. just see it again and look at it again. And it's it's just, it's a treat for the eyes, right? Yeah. You've gotten lots of compliments, um, candy for the eyes. Yeah. Right, a lot of wonderful presentation. And yeah. I just... I love loved it. Book. Beautiful. Well, thank you. Well, earrings are great. Lindsay, thank you. Really thank you. And I'm just putting. It was so fun. It's uh, thank you again, Lindsay. Thank you, Jennifer. This thank was a you, wonderful Lindsay. evening. Thanks, Joan.